University. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to the International Biochar Symposium. I would like to talk about carbon removal with corn stover. For those that did not grow up in, in the Midwestern United States, corn stover is simply the residue from a maize harvest consisting of stalks and leaves. I would like to start with a brief introduction to the Bioeconomy Institute. The mission of the BEI, as we call it, is to develop innovations in agricultural practices, ecosystem stewardship, and bio-based manufacturing to enable the emergence of a low-carbon bioeconomy. Carbon removal with corn stovers would be one element of a low-carbon bioeconomy. I'd like to also indicate the difference between carbon reduction versus carbon removal. Many of you are already aware of this, but I think it's important to make this distinction when talking about our technology. Carbon reduction reduces the rate that greenhouse gases enter the atmosphere. Examples would be substituting battery electric vehicle for, for gasoline powered internal combustion engines, wind power versus coal fired power plants, are geological storage of CO2 emissions from coal-fired power plants. In contrast, carbon removal is the net removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This can be accomplished by growing trees, assuming that you don't cut them down, build soil carbon in croplands, geological storage of CO2 emissions from ethanol plants, or in this case, sequester biochar from pyrolysis of corn stover in soils. We're working on the premise that economical carbon dioxide removal will be more readily achieved if the process also generates energy products or other revenue generating products beyond sequestered carbon. You'll see that our approach to pyrolysis is able to achieve that. Most participants of the conference are well aware that biochar has potential as a carbon sequestration agent. I would simply like to point out that it does consist of a recalcitrant fraction and a labile fraction. Uh, the labile fraction will be very quickly mineralized while the recalcitrant fraction will remain in the soil for millennia. This is in contrast of leaving Stover on the field where it will quickly be mineralized and, and uh, essentially consume all of the carbon over the course of a few years. I want to also emphasize that, as most in the audience are well aware, is that biochar, by nature of its high porosity, has additional ecosystem services tied to this increased surface area, which incre includes increased nutrient retention, improved water holding capacity, and reduced nitrous oxide emissions from soils. Here I'm simply illustrating an experiment done at one of the Iowa State University farms where a single row was, was covered with biochar and worked into the soil compared to the surrounding rows. Now, granted, this was fairly poor soil, but you can see the dramatic increase uh, due to the addition of biochar, much of it related to that water holding capacity. Of course, biochar is produced by the thermal decomposition of organic compounds under oxygen starved conditions, usually in the temperature range of 350 to 600 degrees centigrade. What I would like to emphasize here, though, is that this solid known as biochar is not the only product. There is a flammable gas product as well as a liquid product, which in our technology is very important to the uh, economics of the system. Uh, here I'll simply sim illustrate that uh, burning green waste in the backyard is a way to produce both biochar and bio oil. This white smoke representing an aerosol of fine liquid droplets that we capture and get economic value from it. Pyrolysis comes in more than one flavor. I generally, though, break it down into simply two, slow pyrolysis and fast pyrolysis. In the case of slow pyrolysis, there are several advantages. It's a very simple, well-established technology. The charcoal industry has been around for hundreds, if not longer, of years. Uh, it has low capital costs. You can show it can be a very simple apparatus to produce the charcoal. And it typically has large biochar yields compared to fast pyrolysis. But it's not without challenges. The low BTU gas is the major co-product, and it is a fairly low value. 
It is not as amenable to herbaceous feedstocks. You can see the traditionally large chunked wood was uh, used in its operation. And the overall economics uh, appear to be less attractive than fast pyrolysis. This is an internal rate of return analysis that, that we did uh, several years ago, uh, comparing slow pyrolysis where the cost of feedstock was zero, uh, fast pyrolysis where the cost of feedstock was zero, and then a scenario in which uh, the cost of the feedstock was $83. And this assumed the properties of corn stover in this analysis. And although they all had showed a positive internal rates of return, uh, it was considerably greater than in the case of fast pyrolysis, uh, which will be very important to new technologies to have these uh, kinds of rates of return that uh, exceed 20%. Fast pyrolysis also has several advantages and challenges associated with it. Among the advantages that it produces value-added products beyond carbon sequestration agent. Here is illustrated the uh, white smoke that I showed earlier uh, having been condensed into a black liquid. This can be upgraded into, for example, renewable diesel fuel or bioasphalt. It is suitable for processing distributed biomass feedstocks uh, because the uh, pyrolyzers can be built at relatively small scale uh, and it has promising economics as uh, I will further discuss. The challenges include the fact that lesser carbon is removed uh, than in the case of slow pyrolysis and that simply reflects more of the carbon goes into products such as the bio oil. The upgrading of bio to fuels is still under development. Here's an illustrated a, a quarter ton per day fast pyrolysis pilot plant at Iowa State University. That is the basis of the analysis that I will be presenting. This slide summarizes the characteristics of the pyrolysis system developed at Iowa State University. First of all, it uses crop residue, specifically corn stover, as low cost and sustainable feedstock. It operates under what we refer to as autothermal conditions, which eliminates external energy demand, simplifies and intensifies pyrolysis, and reduces the capital and operating cost. And I'm going to detail this in some later slides. And like all fast pyrolysis systems, it produces energy products as well as carbon sequestration product to improve the economic prospects of carbon removal. Now within this uh, category, we uh, do some unique things to actually recover more than simply bio oil, but uh, produce it as both a sugar and a phenolic oil product. Conventional wisdom tells us that pyrolysis should be used for woody biomass and enzymatic hydrolysis used for herbaceous feedstocks. The high ash content of herbaceous feedstocks is problematic for pyrolysis. For one, it catalyzes decomposition of carbohydrate to low value light oxygenated compounds. It also promotes what's called ash fouling and unstable operation of fluidized bed reactors. I'm trying to illustrate this here, this is mislabeled as pressure fluctuations. In fact, it is showing temperature fluctuations that build over time. We see a similar behavior in the pressure fluctuations and it's the result of agglomerates of ash building up in the bed. It causes the bed to defluidize. At the end of this experiment, uh, we vacuumed out the of the loose sand that's used in a fluidized bed to reveal the agglomeration of the ash with the sand in the bottom of the bed. Uh, however, we were able to make changes to the operation of our fluidized bed that resulted in stable operation over long periods of time. So we feel that we have overcome uh, this challenge in using corn stover as a pyrolysis feedstock. I mentioned that we operate our pyrolyzers autothermally, which is simply the notion that instead of providing heat to the reactor from external sources of heat, we add a little air to the reactor to have partial combustion of the products of pyrolysis, thus releasing enough heat to drive the pyrolysis reactions. This actually is a very small amount of air. We characterize this in terms of equivalence ratio which is the amount of air that goes into the reactor compared to the amount of air that would be required to completely burn up the products of pyrolysis. We're 
operating down here at equivalence ratios of 0.06 to 0.12 uh, compared to uh, one for combustion. Uh, traditional pyrolysis would be one. I'm sorry, zero. Uh, the uh, advantages of this autothermal operation is actually the reactor is much simplified. You eliminate all the heat transfer equipment that is typically associated with a pyrolysis system. We also have discovered that it intensifies the pyrolysis process. That is, we're actually able to uh, process much larger amounts of biomass in a reactor of a given size than would be possible if we have to provide the heat externally to the reactor. This process intensification is this illustrated by this Sankey chart, which compares the mass flows associated with conventional pyrolysis at the top versus autothermal pyrolysis shown at the bottom, where we add oxygen uh, to the process. You'll notice that the conventional process, pyrolysis process is converting about 7.8 kilograms per hour of biomass in a reactor of 8.9 centimeters diameter. When we adjust the operation so it's autothermal in the same 8.9 centimeter diameter reactor, we found that we were able to process uh, almost three times as much biomass in the system. Over in the right, you see the product yields. I'm gonna, uh, I've, I've circled in red the heavy ends yield, which is preserved during autothermal processing, we have a, a small decrease in the amount of biochar, indicating that biochar is actually a, a source of this, uh, of this energy during autothermal operation. I also mentioned that we produce multiple products with the idea of improving the economics of pyrolysis in the production of biochar for carbon removal. I want to refer to this as a pyrolysis biorefinery to reflect the multiple products, which include an unrefined sugars from the polysaccharides in the biomass, a phenolic oil from the lignin, an unrefined acetate from the hemicellulose component of the biomass, and of course, biochar. Uh, we get all four of these products, regardless of whether we're using woody or herbaceous product. Uh, they will change though, uh, depending on the amount of carbohydrate and lignin and ash that are in that uh, feedstock. Uh, we talk about valorizing these uh, four products as follows. We think of uh, first generation products. The sugars can be uh, cleaned and used uh, in fermentation to produce ethanol, but we're also interested in future products, which would include pharmaceuticals, polymers, and alcohol to jet. And this is because the sugar is something called levoglucosin, uh, a, a much, actually much more valuable than uh, glucose as a sugar product. Uh, the lignin component, producing a phenolic oil, uh, our first generation product is a bioasphalt. I'm gonna show another slide on that shortly. Uh, and we have renewable diesel, octane enhancers, and bio-based chemicals as potential future products. The unrefined acetate has a lot of potential future products. It's going to take a considerable more effort to develop than simply use the energy content of that for in-plant thermal energy, which is our current plan. Of course, the biochar will be used as soil enrichment and sequestration of carbon but we also see it has tremendous potential for slow fertilizer. We have uh, several staff working on this topic. I will not be discussing it today though. The so-called phenolic oil from the pyrolysis of lignin in the biomass results in a viscous reactive material that uh, has challenges in its refining because uh, in contrast, petroleum is fairly unreactive and they've learned to use uh, catalysts and pressures to get it to be more reactive in producing products. Uh, this phenolic oil, you, you set it in a container at room temperature and it will undergo reactions on its own. Uh, we have exploiting that reactivity to actually produce a, a bioasphalt. This is, was produced from red oak, but we have also produced it from corn stover lignin. In fact, in this case, we paved part of a bicycle trail in Des Moines, Iowa, the capital of the state of Iowa, uh, with this uh, phenolic oil. So this has tremendous potential as a 
valorized product. In fact, it's probably comparable in value to converting it into renewable diesel fuel, but at less processing cost. Now, pyrolysis of biomass does not convert all of the biogenic carbon into a carbon sequestration agent, but enough of it is that we can achieve a carbon negative outcome uh, for a number of different scenarios. We've done this both for fast pyrolysis, sh uh, shown as FP in, this bar in these bar charts, or autothermal pyrolysis, ATP. Uh, we've also looked at scenarios for uh, corn stover, red oak, and yellow pine. And you'll see that these various scenarios, some of them uh, have a, what we call a pretreatment PT applied to the, the biomass. In some cases, we did not do a pretreatment. Uh, in the, all the fast pyrolysis cases, there was no pretreatment. So we've got a variety of scenarios here. And in all of them, we see at the top the carbon removed uh, compared uh, carbon removed or carbon uh, being a, a, a negative quantity versus carbon emitted, which would be a positive quantity. And we see in all these scenarios that there is a net carbon removal measured as kilograms of carbon per kilogram carbon in the biomass. It's important that carbon removal is an economic process. We're illustrating that that is the case for autothermal pyrolysis of corn stover. Uh, we're plotting, which is a function of the value of the co-products of fast pyrolysis. And so we're here showing the uh, price of sugar on a ton basis over time from 1996 to 2020. Also showing the price of carbon removal dollars per ton of CO2 basis. We we'll start by looking at fast pyrolysis in red. There's no pretreatment, very little sugar is produced. So the cost of carbon removal shown here on the right is independent of the price of sugar, which is actually very quite a bit uh, over time. Uh, that price is about $25 per ton of CO2 removed. Uh, more promising is autothermal pyrolysis, even with no pretreatment of the biomass. Again, very little sugar is produced. And so it, the uh, cost of sugar of CO2 removal is pretty much independent of the year that this analysis is done. And we see that we're actually getting slightly negative uh, cost for carbon dioxide removal. That's made possible by the fact that the phenolic oil is still a major product and carries a value about $500 per ton of phenolic oil produced. We look at one final scenario and that is also autothermal pyrolysis. This time we're looking at pretreatment, which tremendously increases the yield of sugars from corn stover, which normally would be cl close to zero. Now, as a result, sugar being a major product, we see that the cost of carbon removal is going to be strongly tied to the historical price of sugar. And we'll see that since about 2009, that the price of sugars have been high enough to essentially subsidize the carbon removal. And for uh, since that time, the cost of carbon removal has actually been negative. Many of you are probably familiar with Elon Musk's X prize in carbon removal. Uh, it includes both uh, uh, milestone prizes, which are uh, $1 million uh, prizes for demonstrating the economical or technical feasibility to remove a million tons of CO2 equivalent per year, and also a grand prize, which this is actually uh, accomplishing that removal of a thousand tons of CO2 over the course of a year. Um, and this is a $50 million prize. Uh, the Bioeconomy Institute put together a carbon removal team. Our partners are Stein C Company, Frontline Bioenergy, which is building the system in Iowa State University, which is the technology provider. The technology, of course, is the ISU pyrolysis technology that I described, and it's incorporated into a modular system. Uh, the approach is to do pilot scale research to, dis, uh, to guide the design of a 50 ton per day demonstration plant using corn stover 
as the major biomass feedstock. Our XPRIZE application has several attributes. It's tightly integrated with local agriculture. Farmers provide the corn stover from which the biochar is produced and then accepting the biochar for incorporation into their fields. We're working with a sustainable biomass supply. We're only removing 40 to 60% of the corn stover with the rest remaining for erosion control. And this will provide us enough material not only to produce over 3,000 tons of biochar, but also almost 5,000 tons of bio oil. The biochar provides multiple ecosystem services, building soil fertility while durably sequestering about 70% of the carbon in the biochar for hundreds of years. And the coal products drive profitability as we previously discussed. In this case, uh, we're going to be producing a bio asphalt uh, from the bio oil uh, with the possibility of also upgrading it to renewable diesel. This past spring, we were notified that the Bioeconomy Institute Carbon Removal Team was to receive a $1 million XPRIZE Milestone Award. Uh, there were 15 awarded across the world, uh, several in the United States, but we were the only one to receive one in the Midwestern United States. Illustrated here is one of the systems used to generate the pyrolysis data for our application. Stein Seed Company is financing construction of a demonstration scale autothermal pyrolyzer, which will be used towards the grand prize application. It will process 50 tons per day of corn stover. The time to remove the equivalent of 1,000 tons of CO2 will be less than 100 days. Here we show the Stein pyrolyzer um, in place. It was actually built as modules. You'll see the, the red dashed lines are indicate the various modules, a biomass handling system, a biomass conversion module, bio -oil recover module, and then the biochar recovery itself with additional ancillary uh, utilities provided. For more information on carbon removal with corn stover, I refer you to our webpage or you can contact me directly. Thank you very much. I see a question. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Yes, I, there's a posted in chat. Uh, what is your opinion of the mobile pyrolysis of corn stover like the system produced by Climate Robotics? Uh, yes, it's an intriguing system, the notion that you could actually move a pyrolyzer across a field at the same and, and convert corn stover into biochar at the same rate that you're driving that system across the field. I think there are challenges in any kind of mobile system. Uh, there's the issues of economies of scale. Uh, that means simply that the larger you build a unit, your, your unit costs go down. And so these small systems will be challenged. Uh, by that. Uh, our systems are not gigantic. They're, we're looking at 250 tons per day as a, a, a commercial scale. And even that's pretty small compared to a lot of other kinds of uh, processing. So economies of scale will always be a challenge. Modular manufacturing can overcome that both from uh, a modular system like ours or the uh, mobile system of the type that Climate Robotics is building. Thank you very much. Any more questions? From the audience, I would like to ask uh, Professor Brown. In Germany, uh, we are dealing with uh, pyrolysis plants, uh, always burning directly uh, synthetic gas. So uh, your approach, I think, is more on the material regaining side, mm -hmm. as I learned. This would give us the opportunity to uh, walk uh, the plants around in the fields and uh, fr uh, from spot to spot. Mm -hmm. So did you got an idea already what to do with the pyrolysis oil, for example? A, a good question. And we spent a number of years looking at the ability to valorize the oil. Qu quite frankly, bio oils is a mixture of hundreds, if not thousands of compounds which makes it a really challenging material to valorize. But we have discovered that we can pull sugar out of the bio oil. We can separate out of what we call the phenolic oil 
And once we have those separated, our opportunities to actually use them in important applications improves dramatically. For example, the sugars now, instead of being a, in a dilute aqueous space, it, it, it's actually a solid sugar that we produce, can be used in uh, fermentation, for example. Uh, the phenolic oil, I mentioned uh, production of a bioasphalt. We've also converted it into renewable diesel. And we see those as the two major uh, co-products in addition to the biochar that makes this process economical. Thank you. Another question here in the middle. Question for me. Um, autothermal pyrolysis for me sounds a bit like gasification. Maybe you can highlight the differences in the process and mm -hmm. how you can ensure that the pyrolysis temperature doesn't rise up to maybe 800 degrees or something mm -hmm. where you would have a gasification process. Uh, excellent question. I'll define gasification as turning a solid into a gas. This generally does occur at, at higher temperatures uh, than is the case for pyrolysis. Uh, it is also what we call an equilibrium process. You have to give it enough time for the solid to actually be converted into a gas. In contrast, pyro pyrolysis is a conversion of a solid into a liquid. This generally occurs at lower temperatures and it is a non-equilibrium process, which usually means that it's not only a fast process, but you need to quench the product so that they wouldn't continue to gasification. Uh, the way we control the temperature in our system is yes, we're putting oxygen in. And if we put enough oxygen into the system, or it's actually air uh, in this case, it would drive it more towards gasification. So we, are, uh, we actually have a control system that is monitoring uh, the temperature rise in the system uh, to, to determine uh, and uh, monitoring the amount of air going in so that we control the temperature to 500 degrees centigrade, which is considered the sweet spot for converting biomass into the liquid bio oil. I hope that addresses your question. It does. Any more questions? Yes, over here, please. Thank you. Uh, this is Jan Paulintner from Bochum University of Applied Sciences. Um, first, thank you for your presentation. Uh, second, congratulations on that XPRIZE achievement. Actually, thank we you. submitted another proposal, but it was absolutely not successful, and I understand why yours was. Um, so uh, about that, um, so if you're actually aiming to remove a gigaton of CO2 from the atmosphere mm -hmm. per year, um, how much corn stover does that mean? And given that you need to leave some in the field for erosion control, um, is there enough corn stover in the contiguous US uh, to, to actually do that? Uh, excellent question. Uh, a gigaton is a lot of CO2. Now, of course, we're removing uh, solid carbon, so we're not carrying along that, that oxygen. So there is a, a mass balance uh, advantage of using a biochar versus actually sequestering CO2 uh, in underground deposits. However, at a gigaton, uh, you could not achieve it with bio, uh, I'm sorry, with corn stover alone. Uh, we were looking, our analysis was to look at the potential for meeting a, a million tons of CO2 equivalent. And that's still a lot of biomass, but it, it could be achieved with that. If you're, if you're looking at very large scale carbon removal with biochar, you will be looking at uh, both herbaceous and woody feedstocks potential. And uh, David Laird, a colleague of mine a few years ago, did the analysis and, and looked at that potential. And his answer was, was yes, but it would be part of, of a carbon removal solution for the planet as opposed to being the only thing that you do to achieve the levels of carbon removal necessary. But this would scale. Mm 